So it's a great pleasure, a great honor for me to introduce uh, Fanny Forjo, uh, which is going to speak about uh, big data and, uh, and she's uh, CEO from, uh, uh, of uh, Linkfluence. Uh, and so I, I give uh, it's a, uh, the floors. The floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to uh, to be here today. And um, well, even though I have a background in um, academical research, what I'm going to present you today is um, really. Um, I would say client, business, and market-centric, so I kind of feel guilty about that. But if you have any um, scientific question at the end, if you want to, to go into uh, methods a bit deeply, um, don't hesitate to ask. I was going to say, uh, let's leave the question at the end, but I'm thinking if, if you have like a, um, an urgent question that you need to ask, otherwise you would not understand the rest of the presentation, well, feel free to interrupt. I would be happy to try to answer. So as I said, I'm going to talk about, uh, about market, market research, and um, I'm going to, to share um, some experience on how we use big data, how we use the web, to do market research. At Linkfluence, we, we, we have uh, clients in several fields, including uh, food and uh, agriculture. We work for uh, brands, but also for uh, institutions and uh, NGO. I think I'm going to sit down. It's uh, much better. My job uh, at, uh, at Linkfluence is to run the Market Research Institute, but Linkfluence is not doing only research, it's also doing big data. What we do is we uh, listen to the web. The word listen is very important. I'm going to, uh, to, to talk a bit about that uh, afterwards. We listen to the social web and uh, we grab data and we talk about big data because it's a lot of data and I'm going to tell you a bit more about that as well. My first objective today is to uh, kind of deconstruct the illusion that big data is a revolution. Yeah, of course it's a revolution uh, as it is, but for market research it is not a revolution. Uh, for the simple reason that we use the same methods uh, than research uh, and market research. The huge difference is the field that we do our observation on. Our field, our only field, is the social web. So during the introduction, I'm going to go uh, through the uh, definition of the social web and uh, the um, uh, discipline that we call social media listening or social media intelligence. And then I'm going to give you a, a glimpse of what we can do uh, with the big data in terms of market research, how you guys could use big data as well to, uh, to deepen your problematics and to, uh, to understand what people say on the web. And for that, I'm going to go through four examples around the world. The first one in China, about uh, uh, concerns on the origin of food. A second one in Saudi Arabia, which is not a market that we explore very often. So I think it, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to, to go through that example. A third quick example on, on France and the production of uh, cocoa. And the last example on the uh, American market and on uh, food and well-being. So what does social media intelligence mean? Um, social media intelligence, it, it, it's kind of uh, like a, a, a chain supply. We, we talked about that earlier. It's really hard to translate it into French. And to be honest, we, we like to use English words in French because it sounds very cool. But uh, what it means is uh, market research applied to the social web. That's all. To understand what social media intelligence or social media listening means, we need to understand what is the social web. Why do we say social? Because um, um, on some places, 
uh, in the web, people can interact with each other. It's an open place, it's a public place, and people can publish publicly uh, whatever they have in mind. Um, and it can be text, it can be photos, it can be videos, but it can also be emojis. I don't know if you're familiar with it, I'm going to show you an example. It sounds uh, anecdotic, but it's uh, very interesting. So what is the social web? It's about tons of people sharing every day, tons of content and, uh, and on uh, lots of platforms. So it's social networks, as you probably know already. 1.2 billion people connect on Facebook every day, so it produces a lot of data. 5 billion videos are watched on YouTube. Um, 500 million messages are published on Twitter. Um, and what's new is uh, actually the, the weight of Snapchat. Uh, 158 million people chat every day on Snapchat, so it's a brand new uh, network. And it's very interesting to uh, um, realize how um, important it is for brands today. But the social web is also um, old traditional uh, internet places such as um, media. So what we consider social is the places where people can actually publish comments uh, after an article. It's also blogs, forums, websites, portals, marketplaces and review places like, uh, like Yelp, like uh, um, wherever you can uh, um, evaluate uh, your shopping on Amazon, for instance. And it's also local networks that are not worldwide networks, but... Uh, um, <coughs> <clears throat> sorry, um, networks uh, in uh, Russia like Vcontact or uh, in uh, China like uh, Weibo. Listening to the web is not listening to people directly. We are not plugged to whatever people share on the web. So that's one first bias that you need to have in mind. Big data is not about listening to people, it's about listening to platforms. People share content, they publish content on platforms, on social networks, etc. And what we do is uh, plug our uh, listening tool to the platforms. Maybe you're familiar with the fact that uh, Facebook, for instance, uh, we can't get the data directly from Facebook. We have to go through a provider, and this has a cost. Um, and it's important to have this in mind because it, um, it tells you how uh, impossible it is to have an exhaustive view of all the data that people publish on the web, because Facebook, they uh, impose us to go through a provider. It means that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a cost and there is a, a business model uh, behind, and they give us uh, the data that they want to give us. So it's not, uh, it's not a free access to data. It's extremely important to have that in mind. So we are here, we are between those platforms. Some of them, of course, we can, we can crawl them directly, we can, uh, we can plug our tool directly, like uh, media, for instance, but some we can't. And we work for uh, clients such as uh, McDonald's or uh, uh, pharmaceutical and luxury uh, brands. We hear a lot about digital transformation uh, in, in our uh, business. Uh, and what you have to keep in mind is that big data in terms of Listening to customers, listening to, to stakeholders uh, and market research, it, it, it's just a really tiny uh, uh, spot inside the entire um, frame of digital transformation. What we do um, implies a lot of uh, uh, levels, of different levels inside the, the organization, such as marketing, communication, uh, public affairs, etc. And what you have to know as well is that uh, in average, uh, organizations in the uh, Western world, at least, they have two to five different tools to listen to the web. Where I work, it's one of uh, a lot of tools. Uh, we are probably 200 companies uh, today in the world doing the same job. So it's like a really tiny example of what you can find. <coughs> And this is a picture showing you the entire uh, um, components of, uh, of, of, of listening, of, um, of big data. So it, could, uh, it, it can be used to engage directly with people. It can be used to record information. And our uh, topic today, my topic with you today, is just about getting customer insights. 
As I said earlier, what we do is provide data and also provide services. Um, this is a specificity of, of our uh, uh, company. Um, we don't only provide data, we also provide a layer of analysis whenever you need to uh, get help on how to analyze the data. Um, one last thing I need to, uh, to say about the, the specificity of our business is that we only listen to public conversations. We, are, we, we don't have any access to uh, your uh, private uh, messages on Facebook. We don't have any access to uh, um, whatever is closed and private in any social network. And we don't have access to uh, people who don't want to be listened at. So we, uh, we have a kind of open data policy. We also have to follow a lot of legal issues that are evolving every day, uh, such as the, the fact that we have to report all the secondary effects that are published about uh, medication uh, to our uh, clients in the pharmaceutical industry. And also, whenever we make recommendations on how to engage with people to sell more yogurt or sell more uh, handbags or whatever, we have to follow regulations uh, according to the countries. To conclude about this, uh, this introduction, um, you probably know that, but I think it's important to, to say it again. Uh, is big data uh, just a gigantic database? Well, it is, in a way, but it's a gi gigantic database that has three um, proprieties that are extremely important. The first one is about volume. Well, no surprise, big is about volume, but... What is important to have in mind is that it implies a dedicated treatment. You can't analyze uh, big data, uh, an, an exhaustive set of data uh, uh, in Excel. You have to use dedicated tools. But it's important to have in mind as well that if you want, you can sample big data. You can uh, um, uh, have a um, kind of a random selection of big data and have a reasonable size of sample, and you can definitely uh, make a relevant and scientifically correct analysis of big data through a sample. So it's not a, a, um, an obligation to use huge volume of data. Of course, the, uh, the method of, uh, represent, uh, of, uh, of sampling is important, but it's totally possible to do it. Variety is also an important uh, propriety of big data. Um, variety means that uh, the publications that you find on the web are, are, are not of um, the same nature. You can't compare a tweet and uh, a blog post. You can't compare uh, any uh, media comment and uh, a media article. You have to make sure that whenever you want to analyze the content, you know what are the proprieties of, uh, of this content. For example, a tweet can be uh, viralized, can, can spread much faster than, um, than an article, for example. You have to, to know that some uh, social networks are, um, are here to um, share content that is published elsewhere, but they are not places where you publish original content. So all those uh, 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 properties are um, um, kind of a, a bias you have to keep in mind when you want to analyze this content. And it's in constant mutation. As I said, Snapchat didn't exist two years ago. So you have to, uh, to make sure that you, uh, you are updated on, uh, uh, on how to analyze those, uh, those networks. And velocity, well, velocity means that it's, uh, it's huge and it's extremely fast. It means that if you, if you want to, uh, to be uh, kind of real time in, in terms of analysis, you need to, uh, to collect with a robust tool and you need to be able to, uh, to treat the data and um, more importantly, to, uh, to visualize the data because it's impossible to visualize big data unless you have uh, smart indicators and, and, and smart, uh, you know, donuts and, and uh, graphs that can help you to, uh, to, to visualize in a, in a, um, in a blink uh, the, uh, the meaning of the, of the data. What I want to tell you uh, before we go through the, the examples is that there is no way big data can be representative of anything else than um, social media content. We, we do market research to help brands to understand their customers. 
but uh, what we provide is something that is representative of the social web only. We don't pretend that we're representative of, uh, of what people think in the entire world because not everybody publishes on the web, not everybody has access to, to the internet. Um, and it's important to, to realize that people publish on the web, okay, not everybody, but most people do see what's going on on the web. So what we are representative of is uh, the kind of the mirror of, uh, of the society that is the social web. Does this make uh, sense to you? Can I go uh, to the examples? All right. Don't hesitate to ask if, there, if there's uh, anything uh, not clear. The first example is, uh, is about China. Uh, and the brief, uh, the client brief, was the following. They wanted to know to which extent the Chinese people discussed the topic of food origin on the social web. Well, of course, our client knew that people discuss it, but how much? Is it a huge topic? Is it not? Uh, who are those people who talk about the topic? And uh, what do they talk about exactly? The client was a, a, a dairy uh, client. It's really hard to measure a topic on the Internet. How do we do that? What is the, 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 we say, the KPI? What is the, the, the metrics? What is the indicator that we can use to say this is big, this is not big? So what we chose to do is to compare. We, we chose to compare the size of the topic on the Chinese web. So it's uh, uh, 400,000, okay? Does it seem big to you? It doesn't seem anything to me, but compared to the English web, it's quite big. Of course, there are maybe more Chinese-speaking people than English-speaking people in the world, but the thing is that it's five times more discussed on the Chinese-speaking web than on the English-speaking web. So that's one first information. Now, when people talk about food origin, what do they talk about exactly? Those are the five subtopics that we, uh, that we identified. First, the standards. Um, so, it's, a, it's an important topic, <coughs> but what we, uh, what we saw is that it was only an informative topic which uh, mostly interested institutions and media, not the final uh, user and con consumer. Provenance uh, was a very important topic as well, and uh, we observed an obsession on, on safety and certified sources of milk. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. Locality was a quite important topic as well. Traceability and transparency. And this is an idea of the weight, so if you add all those percentages, it's more than 100. <coughs> because some of the subtopics were found um, together in one single publication. So as you can see, standards and provenance covered more than the third, uh, a third of the total publications around food origin. I'm going to uh, go a bit deeper into the topic of provenance. <coughs> to talk about you about milk source, it's probably not a surprise, but it's really an obsession for uh, the, the Chinese people uh, publishing on the web. Um, and it's, it covers 84% of all the conversations about provenance, so mostly uh, eight times out of ten. When Chinese people talk about provenance, they talk about the provenance of milk. And those are examples of um, uh, what kind of things they publish. So you have examples of consumers' publications, experts, activists' publications, and brands. And we make sure that any time we analyze this kind of publication, we make a difference according to the nature of the author. So you have uh, uh, metrics uh, at the bottom of each verbatim, uh, how many times it was liked, you know what uh, like mean, how many times it was reposted, and what is the reach the reach of a publication is pretty much the audience, the potential audience of a publication, how many people were potentially, uh, um, uh, could potentially read the publication. So that was an example of what, we can, what kind of 
information we can grab out of uh, social web data on this topic. The second uh, case is uh, about snacking in Saudi Arabia. The brief was about an, an opportunity. Is there an opportunity for a food brand in Saudi Arabia? Um, how do people share about their snacking habits? And uh, what do they snack? Why do they snack? And when do they snack as well? What's important uh, to, to have in mind is that uh, Saudi Arabia uh, has uh, uh, in nature a huge opportunity for food companies. Um, 21 billion uh, dollars are uh, um, uh, spent each year on, on food market and it's raising by 10% each year. And Saudis spend uh, nearly 25% of their income on food and drinks. So it's, uh, it's huge. What's important as well is that out of the 31.8 million inhabitants, there are uh, 20.3 million active internet users. It's a huge figure. 1.1 million of uh, social media users and 57 million mobile connections every day. So it's a really connected market. So just when I say that, I, I, tell, I tell my clients, yes, the opportunity is huge. But we, if we go a bit uh, deeper, <coughs> when we compare a sample about uh, food, food in general, and inside this sample, the size of snacking, we realize that snacking represents almost 15% of, uh, of, of the topic, which is extremely important. 15% of conversations about food are about snacking. Then if we go uh, again uh, a bit deeper into the analysis, we realize that social networks are the first place where people uh, uh, share uh, about their snacking moments and their uh, snacking meals, which is a great opportunity for the brand because it's much easier to uh, engage conversation and to activate and to, uh, uh, to, to have a communication um, strategy on social markets. Um, so what we see here is the, the nature of the, of the snack and the, uh, uh, the reason of, uh, of snacking, the motivation, according to the platform. So as you can see on social medias, <coughs> on social networks such as Instagram and Twitter, people would just share about what they eat. Why? Because they want to, weigh, to, to lose uh, weight and uh, because they are uh, careful or careless about what they eat. In any case, they don't feel guilty about it. They don't feel guilty about trying to lose weight or to, uh, to be uh, careless and to look, for, uh, to look for pleasure and to, to, uh, to say, hey, look, I, uh, I offered myself a, a, a cheat meal. That's how they talk about it. Um, on forums, you have much more information and experiences, tips and, uh, and advice, and it's a, a really um, uh, feminine um, kind of source on the topic. And websites and medias are about information and health prevention. Now what do they eat when they uh, snack? Well, in 63% of the publication, publications, they uh, seem to be eating vegetables and fruits. So if you just look at the, uh, the, the, the sample of a few thousand publications and you look for the, the, the words they use to describe what they eat, you would say, okay, well, they eat very uh, healthy. You'll see afterwards that it's uh, not really the case, but that's uh, um, uh, an interesting um, learning. What are their expectations? Well, no surprise, they want uh, taste. Uh, they talk about deliciousness. <coughs> they do uh, look for a clear composition, especially on calories and proteins. They want to uh, snack healthy, apparently. But unlike the Western web, where uh, um, you can find a lot of uh, warnings about the low-fat products, here they don't care about uh, the potential dangers of low-fat and diet products. And they need a feeling of, uh, how do you say it in English? Satiety? Satiety? Anyway, vegetables 
All right, it seems to be fruits and vegetables. It, it seems to be a very uh, um, heavy uh, trend in, in snacking. In fact, uh, vegetables are uh, um, recommended by experts, journalists, but uh, they're not shared as what people actually eat um, from consumers and users. We observed what we call a weak signal. <coughs> The interesting thing with uh, big data is not only to have heavy trends, also to find weak signals. And one of them is midnight cravings. It's an expression that uh, was coming from uh, the West and that grew because we, we listened to one year of publication and we really saw the, the expression growing inside the, the sample of, um, of data. And it seems to be very popular among the, 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 young, uh, the young population. And what's interesting is that they don't care uh, if they eat um, calories at that time of the day. It's as if after midnight, the body was working differently and it was no problem if they, uh, if they uh, ate uh, pizza and, uh, and um, a and, uh, nasty uh, whatever we call it. When do they eat snack? Well, they eat, uh, at least they share about their snack. A uh, little bit in the morning, but not much. Uh, a lot in the evening. A lot uh, late night and, uh, as I said, uh, more and more at midnight. We, uh, we tried to, um, um, after... We, after we identified those uh, general trends, we tried to, uh, defined, uh, to define those trends according to the communities, according to the, the profiles of people. And uh, we realized that the expectations were, of course, different according to the people. So for uh, a lot of them, it's about pleasure, taste, and, uh, and feeling, uh, feeling full. And uh, for another part, it's about uh, eating healthy. And for sports uh, people and weight conscious people, it's about uh, taking care of the amount of proteins and calories. I'm not giving you, you know, detailed results, uh, and, but feel free to ask me at the end if you want to know a bit more. It's just to give you an idea of what we can, uh, uh, what we can grab. I need to, uh, to show you another tool we use to, uh, to go through the third example. This is, a <coughs> this is a mapping of the, um, of the ecosystem of a chocolate brand uh, whose brief was to um, help them to identify places on the web where they could communicate about uh, sustainable development and where they could communicate about the fact that they are truly engaged into a sustainable uh, way to produce cocoa and chocolate. And they uh, asked, asked us to uh, draw the, uh, the, um, the photography the, uh, of the ecosystem of uh, sustainable production of chocolate. So this is uh, what, it's, what it's about. Three things you need, you need to have in mind before I tell you what kind of results and, and, and learning it can bring us. Every uh, dot you see here, it's a web source. So it can be a blog, it can be a, a Facebook page, it can be a media. Every uh, arc you see here is a link, a hypertext link. Whenever um, a place receives a lot of incoming links, it means that it's a reference for other sources. That's how we measure influence. Uh, when uh, someone refers to someone else, uh, well, we um, interpret that in terms of uh, authority. So. If you have a lot of, of incoming links uh, in your uh, uh, website or your blog, it means that you are considered as a reference and an authority by other, other people. So um, the, the amount of links is an indication of influence. The third uh, important thing you have to uh, keep in mind when you look at that is the colors of the, uh, of the clusters. And um, 
the color indicates the um, community, the center of interest of people. So here you have Apparence et Foyer, it's all the uh, websites and blogs about uh, lifestyle, beauty, DIY, uh, home life, etc. Uh, here you have all the blogs about uh, food, about recipes. Here you have the community of uh, sustainable development on the French web, the medias, etc. And what you can notice is that it makes clusters. Why? Because people who are specialized into, uh, uh, into uh, kitchen and recipes, they share, they communicate more with people who have the same center of interest. That's like in real life. And what's uh, really helpful uh, for brands is that whenever you want to communicate with the entire uh, food community, you don't need to address uh, the entire cluster. You can just address a few people here and the, uh, the um, uh, natural mechanisms of spreading of the web will make the work for you. So this is how we can uh, produce a recommendation for our clients and say, well, in here, uh, food community, and here, beauty community, uh, you have people who uh, are okay to talk about brands, uh, they are okay to talk about uh, um, a sustainable development strategy, and they won't say that you're doing greenwashing. They will believe you, and they will uh, potentially share any contents that you could publish about your brand, uh, because they like your brand, they like brands, and uh, they're okay for you to communicate. This part of the web, though, is, uh, is a much more dangerous um, um, pack of uh, communities because th those are specialized about uh, sustainable development. So they will question you. They might uh, accuse you of doing greenwashing and they might go um, into details uh, whenever they want to share your, uh, uh, your initiatives. And those are about, this is the civil society, this is associations, NGOs, this is uh, political parties, so uh, they don't like brands pretty much, so um, be careful. What we did then is to say, okay, this is the part of the web where you can communicate. And if you want to touch um, uh, all the potential and the opportunities in the same time, you can find people like this one. This one is a, is a blog. Uh, you can find this, you can touch this one or you can touch this one, etc. And this is a tool we use to uh, um, simplify the, uh, the mechanisms of spreading and viralization on the web and to help our clients to know where they have to go and how they have to engage with people. It's, um, the, the, the technology that is used here is an open technology, so uh, you can find it and use it yourself, or you can, uh, you can ask um, places like Linkfluence or others to help you to do the, uh, the analysis. You have any question about that uh, weird thing? All right, so. I need to go back, go back to my presentation. You're so quiet. Bah alors. Si tu as un mieux, tu peux <laughs> My last example is, uh, is on the American market. The, the, the brief of the client was to uh, uh, understand better how people refer to food well-being and what they call body care, 
how, uh, in which extent food is an important way to take care of one's body, what are the most influential people and sources, and what is the visual universe of the territory. The idea was not to, uh, um, to implement a communication strategy, it was also to um, feed the, uh, the innovation of the brand to uh, um, maybe potentially uh, invent a new product. I took this example because it was an opportunity for me to share uh, how we um, explore uh, a topic on the web. <coughs> and especially how we, uh, uh, which method we use to interrogate the web. Because we can't just uh, um, uh, write down body care or uh, uh, well-being and uh, body, well-being and food. We need to make sure that we grab the um, diversity of, of uh, conversations and we need to make sure that we um, grab things that we didn't think uh, would exist on the web. So that's an example. We, uh, we, 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 we sat down with a client and we, we asked question, what is uh, uh, well-being and food? Well, it's first it's about weight management. So this is examples of queries, semantic queries we use to, uh, to crawl the web. And as you can see, there is a part of exclusion Meaning, if we want to listen to conversations about weight management, we need to make sure that we don't have what is not interesting for the problematics, meaning uh, uh, pathology and uh, anorexia, etc. And we get rid of uh, anything that's uh, associated to beauty and skin care and cosmetic, etc. Because this is really, really huge on the web, and it would uh, it, it would really um, uh, alter the uh, the nature of the results. And we did the same with body care. So we, what we did is we uh, explored the web to uh, see how people actually talk about the topic. Uh, do they say, uh, I want to lose weight, uh, I want to eat more healthily? Well, no, they use other expressions, and those are examples. First uh, interesting uh, result is that nutrition outranks exercise inside the territory. So that was the first surprise for, uh, for the team. Um, I thought exercise would uh, outrank, but nutrition did, which is good news for uh, our brand. That's the kind of tool we use to uh, um, clean the data and uh, to have uh, uh, an understanding of what people talk about. As I said, it's not easy to uh, uh, analyze uh, big data, so we need tools to help us, uh, like this kind of uh, um, tag cloud. Um, and what we can see here is that people use special hashtags to discuss, and this is also a way for brands to know how to speak uh, um, consumers' language. I was telling you earlier about emojis. It's really interesting to see that people have their own language, their own uh, symbolic language to share about their motivations on body care. Especially, I like the ones uh, with the, the, the arm like that, motivation and inspiration. It's something that you, you find uh, very often when you, when you, um, when you analyze um, the, the luxury, luxury sector, people would, uh, would uh, share about the fact that they, uh, they bought a very expensive uh, purse because they deserve it and because uh, they worked hard to, uh, to deserve it. It's, it's, it's the same with, uh, with food and with exercise. So it's really something that brands can activate to, uh, to engage with, uh, with people. Um, clean eating was a very, uh, very massive trend uh, among this, uh, this topic. One third uh, of the publications uh, were about clean eating. So it's not only about losing weight, about exercising, it's about clean eating. And it's a kind of a, um, a surprise to uh, realize, and I'm sure you know already, what could be, according to you, the ingredient that is uh, the champion of clean eating on the US web? It's avocado. <laughs> Avocado that is uh, really photogenic, 
uh, I don't know if you've heard about uh, food porn. Food porn is not a bad word. It's about uh, how much people love to share about what they eat. And, uh, and uh, avocado is, uh, is really, looks really good on photos. So this is the kind of material that we use as well to analyze. We have a tool that can help us to, to, to grab all the photos and to analyze the photos. And what you can see here is an example of illustrations of what people publish about clean eating. And this is, uh, this is my last slide, and it's uh, also to give you an example of how precise we can be on uh, counting the, in, the, the, the clean eating uh, ingredients. And <coughs> as I said, avocado is the, is the winner. Coconut is also a huge, uh, huge trend. Coconut milk, coconut oil, uh, almonds and uh, kale, uh, etc. and um, <coughs> and uh, spices like uh, cinnamon, brown rice. So this is uh, an example of, um, of uh, what we can do with big data. I hope I was clear enough. Do you have any question? <laughs> Thank you, Fanny, for your very stimulating presentation. I have a very tiny question, but as you know, I'm a, my research topic are about uh, communication and nutrition. Um, I was wondering if you checked if um, the night, co night craving uh, posts were linked to Ramadan period. <laughs> Otherwise, it's so ter terrifying <laughs> that yes, I hope it is. <laughs> Well, we did, of course. Uh, that's what's interesting about uh, the, the capacity to go back in the past. We can uh, grab one year data, two years data, <coughs> and we can see uh, what is the effect of seasons, and we can see what is the effect of Christmas time, not in Saudi Arabia, but uh, in fact, yes, we did, uh, we did go through uh, uh, this uh, religious uh, period, and uh, of course it had an impact. But uh, outside the period, it was huge as well. It, it, was, it was amazing. And it's, night, it's not night craving, it's midnight craving. So it doesn't mean they eat uh, right at midnight, but that's what they, they say, midnight cravings. And it's really strange because when you, when you take a look at what they, what they write, it really seems like there is a magical thing happening at midnight. You can eat whatever you want, it doesn't have any effect on your body. It's, it's really, really strange. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. And uh, without unveiling uh, trade secrets, uh, how do you access uh, all this very valuable information? Uh, do you buy them? Do you uh, crawl them? Do you exchange them? Uh, and then I have a second question after you answer this one. Okay, we, uh, some of the data we buy. We buy uh, Facebook data. We buy uh, uh, Weibo, Chinese data. Uh, we buy, um, we, we pay providers to uh, sell us uh, forums data. Um, so that's the complicated part because we have to be partners and ex for example in China it's, it's extremely hard to have uh, uh, the authorization to get the data and as I said earlier you're not even sure that you have all the data but it's the same for all the you know all the the, the, the providers in the market but most of the data is, is free and we crawl the web to get the data so it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry, it's a huge technical machine. We have uh, 30 uh, developers working on that every day here in Paris. We have a few in China as well, just for China. So yes, it's, uh, it's um, uh, in French we say uh, le nerf de la guerre. Uh, grabbing the data is uh, the key of our business. And you had another question? 
Yes, yeah, so the second question is uh, how is uh, your business and the business of uh, your fellow uh, uh, similar companies being affected in Europe, not in China, by uh, the GDPR uh, regulation uh, starting 2018? By the what? I GDPR, uh, General Protection of uh, Personal Data. Well, as I said, it's public data. So we, we don't... It's Facebook is not. So I'm sorry? Facebook is not public data. Yeah, we, we only get Facebook data out of uh, public data out of Facebook. So it means that we grab like 5% of data. We grab what brands share. We grab what uh, uh, um, careless people share. They think that uh, they uh, crossed the uh, uh, private uh, option, but, but they didn't. So anybody can read whatever they uh, write. So we only get a very, very low percentage of what is on Facebook. Uh, it's the same on Twitter, even though Twitter is more and more uh, open today. And we, we don't get any private data. But the thing that uh, we I'm need to know... I'm of private, I'm talking of personal. It's a slight difference. Yes. Uh, the uh, GDPR, the P in the GDPR yeah. is personal. Yeah, we grab personal data and we can do whatever we want with them except uh, cross data with uh, personal and private information. What I mean is that if we, uh, um, if we want to uh, plug our solution to a, a, a CRM solution and uh, if there are in informations about, let's say, the ethics or the, uh, um, the, um, the religion, for instance, we are not allowed to cross those data and we are not allowed to share those data. The, um, the CNIL uh, has, has been working with us uh, closely to make sure that we don't cross those borders, but I'm sure that we do some illegal things without even knowing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.